Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Hello, and welcome to The Laws of Style. I'm your host, Douglas Hand, podcasting to you from Harlem, New York. And today, I have the duo powerhouse behind the brand, Paper Planes, Ronnie D. Michelle, and Jess C. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Peace. Nice to see you, Doug. Paper Planes was founded by Jay-Z as a luxury fashion lifestyle brand, but also with significant input from Emery Vegas Jones, who is Rock Nation's head of fashion and lifestyle, with an ethos of really inspiration and empowerment with a stated goal for allowing the customer to express themselves beyond fashion. I mean, as Jay himself put it, the paper plane, and I'm quoting, I will not take credit for these words, the paper plane teaches you to imagine. Once you dream, you set your intentions. This is what I want. This is where I want to go. So with that ethos is sort of our, uh, our lightning rod. How is the brand doing with this mission? <laughs> you want to to um, uh, absolutely fantastic. So, you know, we, we want to inspire everyone, you know, uh, so that's, that's been our mission since day one. Um, and I, I think in today's, today where we live with everything going on, it really resonates with people. And, and, and the people we represent also within the building of Rock Nation. Yeah. Well, Ronnie, you know, to that point, you've been working with Jay for a long time. I mean, Christ, our paths probably crossed. We started in like 2000, I'm going to say 2004, 2003. Yep. Early, early aughts, early aughts. And at that time, you know, you were working with another property that, that Jay was involved in. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've worked with him for a long time. Tell us, tell the listeners really how how that started and and how Jay's passion for design and style so quickly became viable business ventures in what you and I both know is a very difficult industry of fashion. So so from um, from day one, uh, Jay Jay was a trendsetter that moved culture. Uh, and, and, you know, I joined in 2000 and I, I really, I've never seen anything like it because anything the man wore at the time would just blow out at retail. Um, and, you know, he went from wearing Mitchell and Ness jersey and certain things when I worked with him at Rockwear, he was very true to who he is and he still is today. So if he doesn't believe in something, he's not stepping out on it. Um, for example, we, we at Rock Aware, when, when I started the, the jersey for, from Mitchell and Ness, was, was a tremendous trend and everybody was on it. And he's like, we're not doing that. It's just not, it's not who we are. It's not real. So mm -hmm. we don't do that. And, and he's always, you know, so today he's always stayed true to who he is and what he believes in. So there are certain things that we don't do and there are certain things we do do. But, you know, he, he went from, he then stopped with the um, with the jersey, started wearing, all of a sudden the polo shirt became fashionable. Um, and at that time it was I, um, um, either polo or um, the alligator, either. Uh, Lacoste, rather. Lacoste. Lacoste. And then we, we created our own and it was phenomenal. I mean, our polo program, we had we called it 32 play, 31 plays of Katrina Robbins. So we had an array of colors and they were just absolutely fantastic. So we owned that space for a long time. Then we went into the space of the cargo short was really big. So we, we perfected the cargo short and we, you know, those two things for our summer were absolutely fantastic. Thousands and thousands and thousands of views. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, 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 working with him has been an absolute pleasure. And he also is somebody who understands the business where he got into it. So when they started Rockefeller Records, they've always wanted to be in fashion. 
they went around to a number of different people and approached them uh, on doing a, a brand. And people just, you know, shunned away from them, didn't believe in it. Yeah. Um, so they went out and they 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 started they started with somebody else. So they had two other partners um, in the business on the fashion uh, who were in the apparel uh, industry, um, and the thing just took off tremendously. Yeah. Well, do you think you know it's interesting because back then, even though that's not so long ago, there weren't the same data points that you have today. In other words, I can look at somebody on. TikTok or on Instagram. And I know immediately if they are an attractive musician or an attractive actor or actress, that the chances of them being able to start a line and have a potential viable shot are pretty solid. So how do you think that impacted sort of back in the day, early aughts, where we didn't have those data points? If anything, you had a MySpace page that nobody knew who the fuck was following you, right? <laughs> Yeah, but back then, you know, back then you had MTV. Okay, so and and you know, every video that was produced became a rock aware commercial, yeah. which was free. They were not blurring out anything at that time. Uh this is this is two thousand and maybe through two thousand and four or five. At one point they stopped because they realized what was going on. So but even at that time, there were plenty of artists who went into fashion and, and were big artists and not as successful. Yeah. yeah. So it's just not, it's not that, easy. it's, you know, you've got to understand who your audience is, what the business model is, how to appeal to them. Because then you also have people who say, well, yeah, I want to start a fashion brand too, but I, you know, I want to be like Gucci. Or I want to do this, or I want, you know, so you have to look at what the marketplace is and how you approach that. Yeah, well, we'll deep dive into some of those business specifics. Um, just, you matriculated from FIT that I'm very fond of. I'm on the board of directors of FIT, and I will hit you up after this to try to get you involved in some of our alumni activations. Um, but tell us about the fashion education you received, both in the classroom and just from your life experiences? Um, let's see. So world of fashion, education of fashion. Um, by the time I went to FIT, I had already been going around designing clothes for maybe about three or four years. I had some friends of mine that had a clothing brand that I was coming up under, and I needed to do an internship for high school. So I interned with them, and that's how I got introduced to fashion. Back then, you know, it was really like in the streetwear space. It was like lots of graphic tees, you know, just that whole printable world. Hats. We dabbled a little bit in cut and sew, which I was able to kind of further my experience or education on when I went to FIT. I, I credit them with that. I guess the best part of like a fashion education at FIT at that time that I attended was just the exposure to different types of people. You know, I was in the menswear program. It was maybe in the whole program. 32 people, 30 people, something like that. By the time I finished, it was only a two year program, there was maybe 18. Um, but each of these people were super unique from different parts of uh, the world, right? Not even uh, New York. And it was um, it, it, it was great because at that point, like everyone had their own point of view of style, especially because they come from so many different places. You know, probably myself, I had another friend, Peter Kim, that was from the Bronx. We were probably the only people that were even interested in taking kind of like streetwear into this fashion space where it is now. And everybody else was definitely like in a higher end, you know, avant-garde, artsy, fartsy space while I was just trying to make cargo jeans and, you know, snorkel jackets, you know, the things that I was exposed to. You know, there is a bit of a stigma on designers who do not seem editorial and are commercial. How do you feel about that? And, you know, how do you think you can express yourself while recognizing, hey, the stuff has to sell and yeah. it has to be something that is not necessarily only going to look good walking down a runway? Well, I think, you know, it's uh, the easiest way on I mean, style, right? Style is the separator, right? Uh, if you have, if you understand your sense of style, right? Like what works for you, you can make anything work, right? I think that's the key or make the things that work for you work, right? So you know, a uh, big fan of like thrift shopping, 
right? You know, I, I love thrift stores because, well, I love eBay. That's like the biggest thrift store in the world. But anyway, I love thrift stores because it's a million different things. Instead of trying to sell you a million of one thing, it's a million different things. And you can take this, mix it with that, flip it over there, you know, shop in different decades. It's like, I think that's a easy way to explain it like style, but from a commerciality standpoint, it's very similar because I think the average person doesn't really care mm -hmm. as much as people that, that are fashionable care. So you just need enough to get by, right? Like, can I fit in with everything that's going on in the world? Like, do I want my fashion to make me stand out? Do I want my fashion to make me blend in? So I think those are kind of like narratives that are always being discussed by the customer. I think that's a, yeah, but from a pure commercial standpoint, how do you be commercial and be cool? That is the question, commercial and cool. I mean, it can't be that hard, right? Because some of the biggest brands sell single items that just live forever. And that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, you know, you look at a pair of Levi's jeans or the perfect white T-shirt, or like you guys said, the polo, which is, you know, just sort of withstood, withstood the stand of time. But, but Ronnie, I'll pivot to you because, you know, you're president, you've been an operations guy your whole career, and yet that's got to inform the design team from time to time. Like, how do you do that where you feel like, and it may not be with paper planes, and it may not be with just. So, you know, I'll sort of lift you from the shackles of potentially, you know, your 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 interworkings at Paper Plane and just say, have you had occasion to tell a design team, hey, you know, half of that proposed line, these samples are not going to sell and you need to go back to the drawing board? Um, no. We're, so, listen, I, I think that one of the things here is we're, we're pretty much all on the same page. Want to push the needle and always do something, you know, that's that's out there a little bit different, you know. Um, I think it's all about balance. So, you know, we we, we look at what we do and we try to balance that. There's some things I look at right away. I'm like, I don't think that's gonna work. Um, but we'll try, you know. Um, we also I, I think we learned that sometimes like you don't do multiplies of something that you're not sure about. So you try one, if it works, then you can build off of that. Uh, but he does get carried away where he'll go all in one direction and we have to sometimes bring it back in. But I think what we do, you know, as a group is we work together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we touched on this in talking about the brand's origins with Jay, but um, merging the music industry with the fashion industry. I mean, they're both so distinct and so different. So, so just, I'll start with you. I mean, how does music, because I know you have a deep and rich background in music, how does that inform your design process? Music, well, I mean, I can't do anything without music. I'll just start there. Like, I, I can't do anything without sound, period. Like, uh, I, need, I need sound to drown everything else out so I can hear myself think. But uh, music, it is just like, wow. Um, from an inspirational standpoint for me and how it informs my design, I think for the most part, it allows me to really understand what I'm trying to do. I think for me, that is the biggest key, right? Because it's not like I necessarily, you know, I don't want to like sound like, all right, if we're doing something that has like a punk rock aesthetic, I'm not going to go listen to punk rock music, right? Because it's not like that kind of verbatim one-to-one -one kind of thing. For me personally, I just need music to kind of get me in a zone so I can hear myself think. Um, so that way I know like where, where I, you know, so I can explore like what's going on in my brain and try to understand it and pull things together and make things merge. I think what's interesting about music today, especially with the um, introduction of like streaming, is you have the widest array of music available to you at any single time. And it, it's just insane. Like, you know, I hear something, I play something, it takes me to something, let the algorithm go on title. The next thing you know, I'm over here doing something. And uh, I think for me, it's just, I need the music to drown out the, everything else that I can hear myself in. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I do think it is a bit of a golden age. You know, I find that those algorithms on Spotify, say what you want about Spotify, are pretty spot on. Uh, from time to time to get me in a mode for, you know, very different work, focused, you know, legal work, but still, you know, give me some Philip Glass and I'm, I'm buckled in. 
But Ronnie, to you on the operational side, um, you know, how do you, so, so when representing a apparel brand that also has roots in music and even perhaps revenue streams that might be generated from that, does it present any operational uh, operational difficulties or organizational difficulties? Well, so that, well, you got to think there are three things that move culture today. It's music, sports, and fashion. And and being at Rock Nation and being under Rock Nation, there are all three components here. Right. Um, the music side, I'm going to say it could be very complicated just because artists, artists are, are they they can be they can be complicated. Uh, uh, you know, so we work with an array of different people. But you know, again, going back to Jay, he and and him going through Rockaway, he understands the fashion business. So he's an easy one to work with. You know, as when we had our Rock Apparel, we had a host of brands. One being Billionaire's Boys Club. Pharrell had a very distinct point of view, um, and could be. I'm not going to say I'm not going to say difficult or complicated, but he always should say, "I'm going to give you a headache today," just because he would want to spin something so different, which would which is also a different. You know, you always have to have a fresh approach and always look at look at things through different lenses, and that's what I try to talk to everybody who works with us. Like, like the more lenses, the more opinions I think an input we have on something, and we have different people here. You know, we have people who are twenty something years old came out of school, to, you know, some of the older people. So it's always nice to have a different perspective. Yeah. Is, is it though fair to say that pivoting when, you know, cutting a track or being involved in music is perhaps easier than pivoting when you are launching a line? No, you pivot all the time. It, <laughs> it, it, it's, but like, it, listen, I wish it's about pivoting all day. Yeah. We constantly pivot. We're constantly, we're constantly also given opportunities to do different things, and you have to seize the opportunity. Yeah. So there are things that move extreme. It's about it's about being. You've got to be. You, it's a fast paced environment, and you've got to understand the environment and our building yeah. in order to be successful here, um, because there are a lot of different moving parts, and you've got to be able to pivot. It's always about pivoting. Yeah. Well, menswear in particular, but I think fashion writ large um, tends to categorize itself a bit, right? Uh, just you mentioned streetwear brands, right? Or I think sometimes heritage workwear or surfwear. Do you think that perhaps for men in particular, when they gravitate to these brands, that they're inhabiting a role and that that in a way, there's some cultural appropriation going on, whether that's good or bad, and we can deep dive into that, but I'll I'll kind of leave the question there. Uh, I think so, but I also think most people don't dress head to toe on a single brand, right? Like your wardrobe is comprised of all different types of garments from different types of places. But you know, if someone comes in walking like a costume, could, you know, could be easy to, you know, uh, could be easy to see it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, so on cultural appropriation, I'll kind of throw it out to both of you. Um, you know, how, how do you feel about it? Do you think that there are elements of a potential long term inclusion for cultures by being appropriated? Or do you feel that there is an inherent sort of disenfranchisement where we're going to take we're going to sample your culture, but obviously there's really never any fund to give back to to, you know, kind of compensate who you're sampling from. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, A, I think you always got to get back. I'll just start there. Yeah, that's one of what we always, <laughs> yeah. you know, you got to, you got to treat everybody fairly at every level, mm -hmm. right? So, and we always think about, you know, how we can give back <laughs> um, and never take advantage of something. And in this fashion, right, so you don't want to be stuck in a box, like, if I go to another country, I, well, I can't shop the clothes there and come back here and wear it. Obviously, I am. But does that mean just because I'm wearing it, you know, like I'm wearing it with the story that, you know, this is how it came to me, right? Like everything is a story about my personal growth and my personal style, which is why I wear the things that I wear. Uh, 
But I think if they're, you know, if we got sometimes people just some costumes and it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's you yeah. know you have a, yeah. But you know, also today, I mean, if you think about it, streetwear is so broad at every level, from you know high, middle to low, it's everywhere. So it, it's, it's, well, in a way, Ronnie, that's my point on inclusion. You almost, it almost doesn't have a label any longer. No, yeah. it used to be like, oh God, it's urban or it's streetwear. It was like, it, it was really labeled, but now it's, 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 it's so broad. I think the only thing that may be negative about that is some of the history gets lost. Or not expounded upon, which I think you know. I mean, it's it's it happens in music, happens in any art form, right? So either you care enough to go do some research, to or you don't, and you know, like, yeah, I don't even know. There's no way. To, there's no way to fight that, right? Well, or when you know, one one of my clients for a long time is the brand Public School, and oh, early in their, pardon. Love, love both of them. Yeah, that love what they do, and as you know, those guys both have very deep knowledge when it comes to tailored men's clothing and have made outright three-piece suits and tuxedos. But every time the press would mention that brand, they were a streetwear brand. Mm -hmm. And it was like, are they a streetwear brand because of the color of the skin of the designers? Or are they a streetwear brand because of what they are actually producing as garments? And that was always a bit of a head scratcher to me. I mean, Dapper Dan could be another one that you would label you know, I mean, he makes absolutely beautiful tailored garments yeah. very creatively, you know, but I think a lot of the press would still label him, you know, uh, urban or streetwear designer. And so I think there is a little bit of a danger in those monikers. But to your point, Ronnie, I think we have gotten past there even needing to be a moniker for what are garments that we see most people in these days. Um, well, so just, you know, I, I didn't want to, to necessarily gloss over your early history post school with members only, and then with rock aware, you know, how do you feel your graduation of roles has equipped you to really now head up as creative director, paper planes? Um, what's the biggest key there? I think, you know, throughout my career, the one thing I continue to focus on, which is, is this is the hardest piece, is building a team. There's nothing harder than that. Um, you know, getting people to understand the vision, you being able to understand them, and you know, because like it's like I guess it's almost like a teacher in the class, right? You have like 30 students, you have to understand 30 different people, but meanwhile, there's 30 people that just have to understand one. So like that dynamic, I think, is one that I constantly am trying to master. Because at the end of the day, I love people. I'm like a super people person. Um, which, you know, there's definitely pluses and minuses to it, but, uh, being around different types of people, I think is the, the best thing for me, right? So just like trying to understand people more, trying to understand people more if you're around different types of people, and, you know, visit different types of places, you know, go to people's homes, like, you know, I'm a humanist that part, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Ronnie, you have spanned decades now in the industry. And so, oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say how many decades, my friend, but it's it's uh, it's been a while. And you have obviously seen the huge tectonic shift now of brands that in the 90s and in the early aughts as a young brand. And this is when we saw a lot of brands coming right out of school, right, where you could get a, a solid wholesale account. Right. And on the basis of that receivable you could fund production and you could be in whether it was, you know, a luxury price point at a Bergdorf's or a Barney's or it was a Macy's or a Bloomingdale's. You could be national and even potentially international, you know, like that without much of an actual outlay of cash. To today, where you need to be online, right? You need to have a, a direct to consumer component. And one would think that's actually democratizing. Hey, you know, I'm online, just like Polo's online, just like Tommy Hilfiger's online, except with SEO and the way that the internet can be played, it actually seems like for young brands, it's harder than ever to cut through the noise and, and get to consumers. Do you, do you agree with that or disagree with that? And, and, and what would you say? 
Yeah, well, so it's a different world, right? Uh, it's 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 definitely uh, uh, more of a challenge, I think, to to start your own brand. Yeah. But you know, there's a couple of young kids. Like one kid um, um, comes up here, he has a brand, and he he gets it out. He makes expensive product, and you know, he goes around and he touches the people, and he sells out. He's still very small, right? But I think if if you're entrepreneurial and you could figure mm -hmm. you could figure out ways to do stuff, you you can achieve it. You know, even like he did a thing like we pasting. You know, he did it himself. He put up one poster, three posters, and, and and filmed it. And you would think he's all over the city. You know, the just younger people think about how they can get exposed. And listen, you've got to be on social media, right? So. And how you build that following, it, it's extremely important today. But yeah. also super key to touch the people because like you don't have a real like yeah, you, know, you got a, a digital fan base. I don't know if a digital fan base is really real unless you have like some other people to speak for you. Like yeah, they vouch for you. Like it's super no, cool. a lot of parties and stuff yeah. like that, and, and touching the people that he wants to be with. Yeah. Well, just how does that feel in the set? You are a people person, self-avowed. You just mentioned it, but at FIT most likely. You were probably in certain classes with people who were very talented designers, but ultimately did not want to be in front of people, did not want to be in front of the media, and probably don't want to have a social media account. So do you think there's now a filtering process where those people are kind of destined to never really run their own brands because they don't have the personality to do it, and they're destined to just be in a supporting role? Yeah, it can, it can work to your detriment, you know? But I guess it's what do you value, right? Do you value like your personal life, your personal space? You know, like instant, you know, internet famous is a real thing. You know, you could be internet famous well before you're wealthy, well before you know you can have like bodyguards or have private car services all the time. Like, yeah, like you know, I don't know if I need people uh, accosting me myself. You know, like randomly all the time. Like, I don't know if that's a that's a lifestyle person that I want to live. But it does suck that some talent can be hidden. Yeah. It does suck. Yeah. Well, one way that brands have latched into talent traditionally is, is through the use of influencers. Uh, you know, and, and and it's not a new thing. I mean, social media influencers, some are legitimately famous for their accolades, you know, uh, on the big screen or musically or in in the sporting realm. And some are famous just for being famous, but notwithstanding, they do have eyeballs on them. And that's always been the case. You know, you go back even to early days and, you know, getting a brand ambassador was certainly a thing. They just did print ads and, you know, you, you talk to kids, they don't even know what those are. But um, what does your brand do in that regard since it does have such a design perspective and unique perspective that it seems like it doesn't need to at least pay for that kind of uh you know endorsement it's uh it that is an interesting question because it's a question we ponder ourselves because like so much of what we do and the access to people that we have here is so great that um how do you you know like you can't you don't want to monopolize it because these are relationships right these are, these are like business personal right and we don't want to take advantage of anyone but then at the same point in time, you know, like we know that we need to play in this world to, you know, exist in this in this current uh, in this current climate of social media, right? Like things have to happen, and when you're not paying for it all the time, like how do you guarantee those things occur? And it's uh it's something that we definitely uh it's something that we definitely talk about amongst ourselves, trying to figure out what that right balance is, so you know we're still true to ourselves at the end of the day. Yeah, well. Certainly collaborations have been another way with brand alignments. Uh, and I know that you guys have done some of those and have some of those coming out. Yeah. Would you like to share? I guess the next one, I guess we had a couple on deck. The one that you'll probably see next is going to be a collaboration with the aforementioned Dapper Dan and the Rock Nation uh, School at LAU. Yeah, School of Music. Yeah, so we are working on a collaborative bucket hat that I believe will be out, is it next week? Next week. Oh yeah, next week. Maybe it's edited by the, it's, uh, the 18th. Yeah. Perfect timing, perfect timing for the summer. 
Uh, and and also, you know, at retail, you guys have some uh, some activation out in the Hamptons or out in Montauk. What's that about? Uh, we have the Paper Plane Surf Shop at Gurney's. Uh, should be launching next week or the week after um, for the summer, which we're very very excited about. Also, have a retail. We're also working on a retail store opening in Soho. Oh um, wow! So that we're very excited about that also. Well, and as you do a foray into your own brick and mortar, I mean, how are you seeing the market? Obviously, Ronnie, you've you've known the market for years. It has ebbed and flowed in the city. Is this a good time to be get, getting into a retail lease? I think I think it's fantastic. Yes, I think it's a great opportunity. It gets us to showcase the brand as we want to. You know, listen, we're a direct consumer brand. We deal with um, select mom and pop stores throughout the country, but all the stores we work with, they can't showcase what we do. So this allows us for you to go in and touch and feel and showcase everything we're doing, um, which is fantastic. And yeah. yeah, there's an opportunity. I mean, retail is definitely alive, it's not dead. Uh, COVID, you know, was an interesting period. Um, it definitely, it definitely drove business online and, and also our wholesale. I mean, both businesses were very strong and continue to be strong, but it's now, it's, you know, we want to, we feel that we need to control our destiny and that's through retail. Yeah. More than the right time to probably out. Well, and it's great with an actual location, you know, it gives everything that you've been putting out there, whether it's social media or your website, truly three dimensions. You create a space where your customer can come and experience the brand in a 360 way. Uh, and it also lets you know more about your customer or your potential customer and, you know, and lead to conversion. Um, That's the customer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there is a lot of, um, a lot of change in terms of the way in which certain brands are marketing their products. Women's wear, men's wear are becoming labels for some brands that are irrelevant. And, you know, they, they either refer to themselves as unisex or gender fluid brands. Where would you put paper planes on that spectrum? And where do you think that the future is going in terms of apparel? You know, will we see gender fluid or unisex brands taking up the bulk of the market with menswear and womenswear being, you know, small outliers or the reverse? Well, man, that's a good question. I thought the gender fluid thing was going to happen years ago and like really dominate. I mean, it's kind of there, right? Like, especially from in the streetwear sense, like, you know, guys and girls kind of share the same wardrobe in the States because a good amount of the product is loose fitting, right? So when it's loose fitting, you know, everybody can kind of uh, squeeze into it. Yeah, men's wear could be women's wear could be unisex. I mean, 26, we're listen, we're a men's wear company, but 26 to 30 percent of our consumer base is women. Yeah, yeah. No, I think in ways women have it easier because they, have <laughs> you know, a lot they, could, they could they could raid the the husband or the boyfriend's wardrobe and and it all fits or it all tends to fit. <laughs> the wonderful thing about women is they love to shop. Yes. Yeah, well, and some men. I love to shop too. Yes, but women shop more than men. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, let's let's get to some more sort of high level questions, and I'll ask this to both of you. It's a little hackneyed, but I always love the answer. What for each of you is the difference between fashion and style? Style to me is is, is an individual. You know, fashion is 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 the brand. So you, you create, you know, we create fashion. How somebody puts that on, you know, three people can wear it and look completely different. Yeah. So yeah. style comes from within, and everybody has a different style. Just like, how you. Yeah, the, the style from within, right? Because like style is really like expression, right? Your visual expression of yourself doesn't even, you know, can be bigger than just clothes, right? How you wear your hair, the kind of makeup you wear, like all that stuff, you know. Um, yeah, style definitely. Yeah, you know, tattoos, you have earrings, you whatever, whatever you do, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, let's take Jay out of the equation, because I know you probably both will submit him in this answer. But for each of you, 
who would you list as your top three style inspirations, whether men or women, living or dead? I can't take Jay out of it. He influences me every day. Fair enough. Fair enough. Two more, though, Ronnie. I think the thing about style that's interesting is you always need to have people that have unique stories, right? Because those are the stories, their histories are really what influences their style. So I definitely like to throw like Andre Lee on tally. I mean, I would throw, I would got to throw like that, but damn, I read his book, his, oh, I listened to his book. It was most, one of the most amazing things I ever heard. I was like, that he was like super inspiring individual. Who else from a style standpoint? I, I, I'll go, I think it's like Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. Um, a Dapper Dan is definitely up there, uh, but but I, I, I to me it's it's definitely Mr. Carter. Um, uh, but you know today Harry is very contemporary. I mean I've I've always liked Brad Pitt, but mm -hmm. that's you know I'm just a little bit older. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think younger. Who, who are, um, Rocky is pretty stylish, right? I mean, you know, I I'm going to go Rihanna, uh, let's say Beyonce, I'm trying to think who else. You want to keep going? You got, you got, you got the big women again. I know, right? oh, I don't, you know, we should, but I, I just like, you know, for me, it's all about the story. So I need to know, you know, more than just how you see them all the time. Like, June Ambrose, very solid. Oh, there you go. That that woman is. I mean, she's, she's hot. You can't, you kind of can't deny that at all, right? Like that's like might be cream of the crop right there. I gotta say Pharrell too. Oh yeah, for Pharrell. sure. Yeah. Well, let's let's slide the question into cities. You're both well traveled. Uh, you both, and and just perhaps you more so, pick up on local styles where you are. So what would you say, and I'll, I'll let you do it as a collective, are the three top menswear style cities for you globally? Hot man, I'm sorry, but Atlanta, what's going on in Atlanta, I've never, I'm just like, I'm always mind blown when I go. It's really there, they're gender fluid, they're gone, they're somewhere else. They're really somewhere else. It almost, it's not like Tokyo, but like the difference is like when you go to Tokyo, like holy shit. But uh, Atlanta is a holy shit moment for me the last few times I went. I, I say, I, I think it's New York, London, and I'm going to go, you know, Seoul. Okay. 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 I got to go Korea. Okay. Yeah, but they, they take it serious. They take fashion super serious. Like, style, right? They take it like, okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I yeah. kind of want to leave New York out of it. I'm going to leave New York out of it for now. We got, we got a little bit of work to do. Well, you know, New York, because we're New Yorkers, you tend to localize it a little bit, right? It's like, I don't, when I say New York, there's not one vision that necessarily pops to mind. Yeah. But if I say Brooklyn, or I say Harlem, or I say Upper East Side, you know, or I say Tribeca, a guy comes to mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think also the internet kind of affects that too, right? With the way information spreads, you know, I don't want to... I'm not going to say it's appropriation, but people are like picking up on other people's style cues and like, oh, I'm going to adopt that, adapt that as well. You know, when in the past, it would be like, it was so much more localized. So you could tell where somebody was from based on how they were dressed. And even the five boroughs had their own, you know, like distinct looks, which was, uh, I don't know, it was dope. Everyone kind of looked a little bit different and not all the same. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you spending your afternoon with me. That is a wrap. I'm looking forward to Hopefully seeing both of you out east this summer. I, I will definitely attend your pop-up. Can't wait. And um, continued success with the brand. Thank you. It was great to see you. Yep. Likewise. Likewise. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Right. Bye. Bye, Bye. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. For more information, go to our website at www.hba llp.com and you can also follow us on instagram and twitter at at hand of the law thank you for tuning in and stay stylish